Hey, Howard. Hey, Sean. Welcome back to another week of Pop Goes the Podcast. You know, I really enjoy doing this. This is a blast, honestly. Uh, I think we're kind of hitting our stride with it. I think so. You know the thing that I like about it the most? What is that? The drinks. The drinks, not the guests. Well, the guests are okay, but I like the drinks. I mean, there's some pretty funny stuff, but... There is. And you know, and the, the guy that we're going to have here this week is a uh, a personal friend of mine. I might have met him once or twice. You have met him a time or two. He's uh, he, he is not from the Tulsa, Oklahoma, but he is a former sheriff deputy out of Greenville, South Carolina. And he has taken a very interesting path in law enforcement. That he has, and... Uh, I think he was a deputy for about 12 years or so. And during those 12 years, he got into a lot of shit. He did, but he got into a lot of shit when he was in college too, which is really freaking funny. And I want to talk about that. Well, he gets into a lot of shit every time he comes to Tulsa, but he those, does. Those, is... those stories are not appropriate for cocktails and cocktails. Cause this is a family podcast. It is. So we will try to keep the cussing down, but, uh, Chad Ayers is our, uh, our, our, our friend with us here today on, uh, on the episode. Uh, met Chad through Live PD of all things. I've heard of that. Yeah, and um, the producer, the cameraman that I had here in Tulsa with me when the show first started, he they left Tulsa. I think they went to like Louisiana for a very short stint, and then on to Greenville, South Carolina. And they actually started riding with Chad, and they started hitting me up on the phone. They're like, "Man, this guy we're riding with, the, the type of police work he does, how he carries himself. He was into CrossFit like myself." They said, "Man, he reminds me of you." So. Um, we actually connected through social media and ended up becoming good personal friends. Yeah. Um, he is, we've hung out together in New York city. I've been out there to South Carolina. He's been here to Tulsa numerous times, as you well know. And I will know I'm actually getting ready to see him again here in just a few days. Um, but what do we like to do on this episode? Well, we like, not this episode, every single show. We do. We like to have drinks and we've had crappy drinks. We've had like Texas tea and apple crown, but you know, the one thing about Chad is he's got some bad taste in certain things, <laughs> some very bad taste in certain things, but he has some very good taste in whiskey. He does. And he does. He likes whiskey. He does. He does. And Chad, uh, thanks for being here with us today, buddy. What are we going to drink today? Chad. Man. The good old Weller Antique 107. Oh, yes. That's a good one. We're going we to have good whiskey. Yeah, we're not doing the uh, the Quincy's episode yeah, one choice. No, we're not having any of that. You actually do have actually, pretty. Yeah, actually, give me one second. I need some Coke to put in this thing. <laughs> you got jokes. <laughs> it's for, illegal, sir. Yeah, for anybody out there listening, uh, any of these Weller products, you don't mix them with coke no I, I disagree man it's your booze you drink it any way you want you yeah know? if you want to be made photo that's right mix it with coke i mean we we have a great friend named alan he'll drink it with coke <laughs> he's a funny guy does funny stuff like drinking whiskey with coke but we're gonna hear uh, we're gonna hear about chad's story chad i mean he he did some fun stuff and then he was on a SWAT team and then he was with the ATF. And well, he wasn't with the ATF. He worked with the ATF, but we'll get you straightened out. You non-policeman. Okay. Well, here's to you, Chad. We're ready to hear your story, man. Cheers. Cheers boys. And actually the reason we went with one Oh seven for this episode, we tried to do something different every single episode. Um, Chad was out here visiting, gosh, a year, year and a half ago or something like that. And as you know, getting bourbon in different parts of the country is much more difficult Stupid. than others. Um, surprisingly, it's very hard to get it uh, there in Kentucky. We couldn't find, we did our bourbon trip out there. And other than paying just astronomical prices for Weller products, you could not find it. And we ain't doing that because we ain't down. No, not at all. Um, and so Chad was out here visiting and he he was looking for a bottle of 107 and we, uh, we found our way into a local liquor store here, and he got to pay a fair price. I think it was 50 bucks or something like that, $55, $60 maybe. I don't know. Something fair for a bottle of uh, for, for, for this. And what, what's it go for out there for if you can find it? I mean, if you can find it, I think the last place I saw it was like 114 bucks. Yeah, just something crazy. Oh, so that's stupid. So he's got uh, – <laughs> I don't is that the bottle you brought back from here? It is. Still, so, like I, I – I cherish it, man. I'm like, 
So, Sean, when you come, when, when you fly in in a few days, can you bring me another bottle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I might just fill up one of these empty ones with something, you like some Apple the, Crown or something. He wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got, like, stacks and stacks of empty, you know, 107s around. We'll, we'll fill them up with something for you. Iced tea. Oh, um, iced tea's good. Perfect. So that's how we ended up with 107 for this episode. So Chad picked that up here in Tulsa. So we, we, we Where did he get it, Park Hill? He did not actually. It was actually a spot out in Broken Arrow. Huh. So uh, one of the suburbs out here. So um, they took care of us and it was right there on the shelf. I think it was just in a little case. But all right, we've got that covered. Let's jump into Chad. Give us a quick rundown of your, uh, you know, how you got in law enforcement. Was this one of those lineage deals in the family? You've always wanted to do it and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, I grew up in a dental family. My dad was a dentist. Um, my brothers are in the dental world, practice management, stuff like that. Uh, but my grandfather was a police officer. He actually started in 1946. Um, and here in Greenville, South Carolina, he was a Greenville city officer. It's like and, when Buckshot um, started. Through that, though, you know. <laughs> that's a, yeah, Buckshot was on his third the marriage. That's the then. one thing. <laughs> that's the one thing i thought i was like man buckshot and him were beat partners back in the day uh, and, but no he started back back then and he was just you know my role model we all kind of have you know role models and you know me and my dad are very tight but shoving my hands in people's mouths for the rest of my life just didn't interest me so um my grandfather begged me not to be a cop and it was just always what i wanted to do so i uh i went to the university of south carolina and, okay, now originally stop. major. You went to the University of South Carolina. But That's before the, you... the game, Cox. Go Cox. The, Cox. Okay. Go, go Cox. Right. But what did you? We don't care what you majored in at the University of South Carolina. We want to know what you actually did for your extracurricular activities. Yeah, so I was the quarterback at the. Uh... <laughs> No. In fact, Howard, I was a cheerleader at the uh, University of South Carolina. Were you a and you how long were you a cheerleader? Were you a cheerleader for four years? I started cheering in high school, my junior year, and then I went on and fulfilled every Southern dad's dream and was a cheerleader in, in college. And like I like I think I told you the first time I met, you know, it's our first game there at Williams Bryce Stadium and we're running the team out with the flags. My dad's in the crowd and he's like, yeah, there's my boy. There he is. And the guy beside him's like, Oh my God, shit. What number is he? And like, the, <laughs> like the, everything he's, left my dad. He's like, uh, he's the bottom of the pyramid. He's, <laughs> he's the one doing back handsprings. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so Chad, how'd you get into cheerleading? You know, I picked my cousin up at a tumbling class one day and my aunt was paying thousands of dollars for her to learn how to do a back handspring. And I was like, why can't you do this? Like, get your ass over it. This isn't hard. And she's like, you can't do it. And so I went out there and did a standing back flip because you did them off the diving board growing up. And this coach was like, Hey man, do that again. I did it again. He's like, Hey, come to our cheerleading practice tomorrow. And I was like, nah, man, I'm good. I play baseball. And I grabbed my gym bag and I was like walking away. And he's like, well, it'll be you and 26 girls. And I was like, what, what time does it start? Wait, what time what? you want me here? What time you want me here? <laughs> so, in fact, I had to lie to my parents and say, hey, I'm going to play golf tomorrow because there's no way I was looking at mom and dad and saying, like, pops, I'm going to cheerleading practice. <laughs> so you are you were a, a I guess you did you letter in um, cheerleading at the University of South Carolina? So I went there my freshman and sophomore year. And then my junior year, actually, I got recruited to go to the University of West Georgia. That was the one of the number one cheerleading schools in the country. And in 2005, won a college cheerleading national championship there. No kidding. You're kidding me. We didn't know this. I did not know this. So you got recruited because you were yeah, such a damn good cheerleader? It, that was it. So <laughs> in 2005, I went and won UCA college cheerleading nationals in yeah, I don't think Sean even knew that. And I 2005, I won national championship. No, so, and then, no. like, it was at the University of West Georgia, and I love that university, but who really wants to graduate from University of West Georgia? So I went back to South Carolina and graduated. Now, now when you were cheerleading, um, now, Chad, Chad and I have worked out together numerous times, and uh, I've seen him without a shirt on. So I'm assuming this is back when you were in, like, better shape, a um, little bit lighter. 
you know, things like that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who you're a good sturdy base. Yeah, it, you know, it, <laughs> it, it's it, it it really is amazing. And I'm hoping through this podcast I get the same photoshopping Sean gets, but I've always oh, wanted those apps. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. have you seen the Photoshop where somebody's giving me giant nipples? <laughs> that's not that's not photoshop oh dude it's out there on the internet somewhere i've seen it a couple of different times have you never seen it it's like these giant pepperoni nipples on me have you seen that i've seen the ones where is that some type of like no but people have weird fetishes i don't know people have thought it was real i've actually been around when i first the, the gym that i go to now yeah they're not they're not they're not that big but the the gym i'm at now when i first switched there uh you know once i got to know everybody they kind of told me they were waiting for me to take my shirt off like during the workout so they could see if my nipples were huge it's true story yeah, yeah true my story. name is a pepperoni yeah okay um anyway so um you get through hey, i'm, I'm uh, curious i'm curious now though man can you take your shirt off real quick <laughs> you pepperoni or morsels <laughs> you, you got to pay 9.99 a month 9.99 a month for that one buddy yeah if you're, you're gonna have that, a cocktails a, and cocktails only fans you're gonna that's you're gonna get this kind of content a lot more <laughs> yeah it's a different podcast um but anyway so you uh get through get through college um wrap up the cheerleading career and pursue a career in law enforcement and you land there in, is it Greenville County? Is that the name of the, the, the sheriff's department you were with? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Greenville County Sheriff's Office. In, in there in Greenville, and I assume it's probably like most other law enforcement agencies, you kind of have to start, uh, you know, as the rookie, you're the beat cop. You're out there taking taking radio calls, driving squad car reports, all the, the normal type of stuff. Yeah, so my first day on the by myself was Christmas day of 2006. And so it was actually like not a bad day to start off. Cause you know, at least in the morning on the, on day shift, it was pretty quiet. Dead, and yeah. then throughout the day, as more people start drinking, you know, whiskey throughout the day, it kind of ramps up. But um, yeah, so I started off as a road cop in 2006 and, and loved it. I, uh, fortunately I was rookie of the year that year. I just, I love chasing bad guys, man. I, I've never wrapped, I, I mean, I'll just be honest. Like I could never wrap my head around these guys that just like sit and wait for the next call. Like I felt like I was called to chase and like catch bad guys and put bad guys in jail. So that's what I did. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I think I said it on one of our previous episodes with somebody, we had a chief here in Tulsa uh, that had a motto. He says, we are not call takers. We are the police. Oh, and I love that, good. man. I, yeah. I, like I said, I think I said another one before, but it was spot on. And, and I love that. It's like, you know, we're not report takers <laughs> or call takers. We're the police. That Man, go out there, be proactive, um, make a difference, get to know people out in your community, disrupt bad guys, you know, their normal pattern of life, be a pain in their ass type of deal. So um, so you get through that rookie of the year. Um, kudos to you. And, and Greenville is a pretty decent sized agency, right? I mean, it's not uh, it's not a tiny little agency, is it? Yeah, I think we're like the second biggest in the in the state. So there's probably 470 sworn deputies. Okay, yeah, um, so good size. And then we have our, our our municipality. So it's 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 a it's a pretty big size. Um, but yeah, I, I did that for about two and a half, almost three years, and then I transitioned over to our jump out unit. Well, when you're rookie um, of the year, do you you get a plaque? What do you get? You get a jersey? You get what? Do you, do you get a pair of pom poms? What do you get as rookie of the year? You know, so we had our awards banquet. This is crazy, I, and I haven't even thought about this since, but there was a guy in town, Mr. Carlton. He was the owner of Carlton Mercedes, and he was a he passed away, unfortunately. Um, but Mr. Carlton lived probably into his 90s, uh, but he was a big supporter of law enforcement. Well, when I won Rookie of the Year, <clears throat> the sheriff called him up and said, hey, Mr. Carlton has something for you, and he handed me a check for like a 1000 bucks just to say thank you for being Rookie of the Year, and I was like – I mean, 2006, being a cop in Greenville, I mean, I wasn't making $32,000 a year. I was like, my God, what am I going to do with this? Yeah. What did you do with that? Do we have a... Uh, I went and bought groceries. <laughs> you went and bought groceries? <laughs> well, at that time, you were a young, strapping man, and obviously, you are bulking up. You hearing us Sorry. okay? Yeah, I got you good. Y'all got me? Yeah. Right. Yeah. We had a little freeze there, but you're back. We got you. Didn't know if it was the bourbon or, or if we lost you there for a minute. So 
Um, so you, so you, uh, get rookie of the year, you get through your two and a half years, you know, out there working the streets. And that's, uh, you know, like I said, like a lot of agencies, Tulsa included, you have to work a three year minimum as a street cop before you can apply for what we call specialty units. And that's anything from gang unit detectives, you know, traffic unit, um, street crimes. You want to work in the property room, et cetera, et cetera. You got to have a basic understanding of how to be a street cop, um, some guys never get a basic understanding yet somehow ended up in some of these units, but I have no doubt Chad did quite well. And you found yourself in a, uh, what was the actual, the name of the unit? Yeah. So it's called the directed patrol unit. So we call it DPU for short. So a bunch of proactive guys, probably about 10 to 12 guys. And we would just drive around in mommy vans and Ford expeditions into the, the high crime areas of, of the County and, basically focused on those areas where, where the most crime was. <clears throat> what kind of, what kind of crime were you guys seeing? You know, when I started, we, it was a lot of crack cocaine, crack cocaine, arm robberies. So we would basically just kind of saturate those areas where we had an influx of just street level narcotics dealers on the side of the, I mean, it was seriously like on the side of the corner of a gas station and it, you could pull up and look like a McDonald's and guys out there serving. And we would, you know, rotate cars a lot and just sit up, watch it. We'd roll in, you know, about five deep in these SUVs, jump out, and it was foot chase central. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Were you pretty fast yeah, was... back then? Why do you keep referring to back then? I'm kind of getting confused about this <laughs> well, back I, then I, stuff. I'm That's pretty bullshit. sure that I could, I could take you in a foot race pretty, pretty sure, and I'm an old man. Uh, uh, let me tell you, before you answer that, Chad, <laughs> Howard ran track, and I'm not joking. He, he has no upper body flexibility, overhead strength, uh, but the man can run and I will vouch for it. He legitimately can run. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying back then, but what I'm thinking is though, is that you're going after these guys, you know, and you, from what I hear about bad guys, they're not in the best shape. They smoke a lot. They drink a lot. They're not going to the gym. They're not working out. You probably roll up on a guy. Did, have, did you ever get kind of close to a guy and just like throw a backhand spring into him and then appear in front of him and go, I got you. <laughs> you know, it, it was so funny because I, I see, and I don't know how it was. Did we just throw back a kid? God, you just um, you totally missed us. You, were, you weren't looking at the camera. We did like a, a double clap, arms up, you know. Did y'all do some? Uh, <laughs> no, we, we were lucky. We wore blue jeans and, and just a, a t shirt with a, an outer, like a Ranger cover vest and just a pistol on our side. So we, we was really light, but. You know, I would always, I'd take off running and I'm like, guys, you would outrun me if you really would like pull your pants up, tighten your belt, but like half your speed is lost by grabbing the back of your pants, like trying to hold them up. And I was like, I got you. Like every single time I got you. <laughs> do, do you talk shit to him? Not, not, not I would in a bark derogatory like a dog. <laughs> Literally bark. No, I would, I would, I would bark. And that was my thing. I would bark and I'd be like, man, I'm going to send the dog. I'm going to send the dog. Rawr, 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 rawr. And like, cause man, these game bangers hate canines. Like <laughs> they, they do. would hate dogs. <laughs> That's so I'd, pretty funny. I'd bark like a dog. I don't know why. <laughs> no, no, I talk smack but, to uh, them, man. When was, I run up, it was seriously. Yeah. I, I talk smack. I mean, not, you know, nothing derogatory, obviously, but you let them know, no. you know, as you're gaining on them, man, I got your ass. I got your ass. Here I come. <laughs> I'm about to get you. I'm about to get you, you know, and then when you catch him, like you said, you know, you tell them, you know, it's, it's a game. Um, obviously it's a game that's got consequences. I mean, it's, it's, you know, there, there's a serious aspect to it, but most of the bad guys don't take it personal. And when you catch yeah. them, you know, you got to let them know, Hey man, my old ass caught you and I'm wearing, you know, I'm 210 pounds and I got another 35 pounds of gear on and you weigh 160 and you're wearing gym shorts and a tank top and, you know, you're an embarrassment. You're an embarrassment <laughs> out, here, out here. You should be embarrassed by this. You know, you got to let them know it's part of the game. So you, went I'll never forget, I'll never, I'll never forget. There's this guy named twin and he would call me, he could never pronounce my first name. So he would call me a Raz. He's like, <laughs> man, Oh, a Raz. He'd catch you on the railroad tracks. And if you don't get into gravel, if you into gravel, he's slow, but if you get in the <laughs> dirt, he's fast. <laughs> Uh, there's a twin, by the way, I think in every hood, man. So we've got a couple, you know, twins, everybody, yeah. there, there's a couple twins. There's a couple pookies. Uh, there's a couple of the same yeah. names out there for sure. 
man. So you, uh, you jump out boys and you actually end up there on your guys's SWAT team basically. And, uh, serve some time on the team there. Is that correct? Yeah. So I did, uh, almost 10 years on the team. That's a long time. Um, you know, I th- you know, in the, in, I think that the, like the national average for somebody being on SWAT or a, a special operations team, I mean, they're one in the same, it's something like three to five years, I think is like the average time on there. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I've heard that somewhere. That's about the average across the country. Why do you think that is? Um, I think, I think it's a couple different combinations, uh, or a couple different, you know, factors in that I was on the team here for seven years. Um, I think there is, as you know, it's a bunch of type A mentalities. You know, you, you, there's very few full-time teams across the country. I mean, just in the major, major, larger departments, you know, your department, like my own, it's a part-time deal. Everybody else has got another job on the police department. So, whereas you're in whatever unit you're in, whether it's patrol, a patrol unit, you're a detective, you're that type A guy that's in that squad. There's usually one or two of you. And you get on a team and everybody is that way. And there's a lot of egos that, that, that butt heads. Um, I think that's a part of it. The other part of it is, uh, you know, I loved the training getting together a couple times a month. You get a lot of extra training in, yeah, but sure. eventually, you know, when you're first get on that team, you love getting a call out. doesn't matter if it's what's what we call an arm to barricaded. That's something that's going to be very slow moving. Um, you get a HRT, which is a hostage rescue deal. That's something you go, you know, like you're on fire. You try to get to that call. Um, and then there's a search warrant service. I mean, those are basically the three type of, t- uh, things that teams get called out on and the search warrant service is a very slow planned out, you know, well ahead of time, uh, deal. And eventually it just kind of gets to a point where you start getting those call outs and you're not rushing to them like you used to. Um, you know, you just kind of get, you just, I don't want to say you get burned out. It's just, it's a, it's a younger man's deal. Um, a lot of younger guys start coming on the team and want to do it and you get a little older. So, I mean, that's, that's my personal experience from it or personal opinion on it. Well, tell me right. you had, when you were on the squat team, um, tell me how you started and tell us another, uh, tell us a story, like a story where you did some good. You know, October, 2010, uh, was it no October 2012 we got a call a hostage situation one night and hostage situations guys aren't like what you see I mean Sean knows this it's not like the movies where you're getting these things you know three and four times a week I mean you get a hostage call it's on so we got a call about several people being held hostage in a single wide trailer uh, in the outskirts of Greenville I, I lived you know about six minutes away and I remember flying up there and all the blue lights around the sh- trailer and I asked this guy, I said, what do we have? He said, a guy showed up here tonight looking for his ex-girlfriend. He knocked on the door and another dude answered the door. That just Uh-oh. happened to be a family friend that was there eating dinner. Yeah, not good. And a lady inside, though, yelled, don't let him in. And when he yelled that, he went to go shut the door. The guy outside took a lever action 30-30, like an old cowboy hunting rifle, shot through the door, forced his way inside, and is taken hostages. <clears throat> And I specifically remember like turning and turning my comms on, on my rate, on my vest. I said, how many people's in that trailer right now? And he says, the bad guys in there, there's a lady in her sixties, a lady in her thirties. And there's a little 10 year old girl in there. Her name's summer. And I remember just like looking at him and he just kind of gave me that head nod. So we deployed out and I put a, we had a, I was assistant team leader and we put a hostage rescue team on the front corner of the trailer. And we put a hostage rescue team on the back door of the trailer. And we actually put an explosive charge on the back door that we can blow it if we needed to get in quick. And we had two snipers across the street, but they were useless. All the blinds were pulled on and all the lights were off. And we just sat there like any, you know, situation and our negotiators got this guy on the phone and negotiations would go up and then down, up and down. And this guy, when the negotiators talked to him, he said, bring me Summer's sister. Now, Summer was the little 10-year-old girl, and Summer's sister was his ex-girlfriend. And he'd say, bring me Summer's sister. I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill myself. And then all y'all pack up and leave. Get your shit out, and y'all are free to go. Hey, Chad. And that happened for about – And not to cut you off there. So when this guy fired the rifle through the door, did it hit anybody? Or he just kind of fired through, and that's how he was able to gain entry? 
nope. So he shot when he shot the door, he shot the guy that was trying to shut the door, who was the family friend that was there eating. <clears throat> and initially we we pretty much had good intel from the suspect that was talking to our negotiators that he's probably dead inside. Okay. So mm. so you've got a guy who's Dang. essentially a murder suspect potentially right now. Um, that guy at the door and then he is holding these people hostage and 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 like chad was saying right there the these hostage calls are very very few and far in between i mean i'm talking like you know tulsa is a big big department here we've got 830 cops or something like that on this uh, you know sworn officers you might get a legit hostage deal once a year and i'm not exaggerating I mean, it's that few you huh. just don't get them um, and so when a legit one comes in, both as that call or that page that comes in, and when you get there and your intel shows it, um, you know, this is the one you have all the training days for. Right. Every, everything else is slow and very controlled. This is something that's going to be a light switch that, that changes. Um, and, you know, as Chad was also talking about there with the negotiations, the vast overwhelming majority of any SWAT call out is done through negotiations. It's, it, there's very few real action on a majority of your calls. It, it, it all handles those negotiators that are on the team. They're not the tactical people. They, they're in a command post. They're doing all the talking. They are the ones that typically resolve most call outs that happen. And they're good at what they do. Outstanding. Yeah. I mean, they are, it's, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know if I could have been a negotiator, you know, that wasn't my thing. I liked the tactical aspect of it. And, uh, but the negotiators we had on our team, man, they saved us from a lot of, you know, forced entries, a lot of, you know, you could what if it potential shootouts or anything like that. And, and these things go on for hours and hours and hours. Sometimes um, I think we had one that went like 30 right. plus hours <clears throat> negotiating with somebody that, that ended peacefully. So I'm um, sorry, Chad, didn't mean to cut you off. Go back. No, you're fine. Well, you know, like I said, he just kept saying, bring me summer sister. And initially guys, we thought summer sister had fled out the back door, <clears throat> but three and a half hour mark hit. Uh, commander came across our comms and said, stand by, we have to make a rescue. And he gave us a countdown, three, two, one, boom. And we blew the door on the back. We breached the door on the front and I was assigned to that entry team. And as soon as I stepped in and turned, I, f I literally felt it. It was a boom, boom, boom. It was the three loudest gunshots of my entire life coming over my back. And I knew it wasn't coming from us. And I kept doing my job. I cleared this bedroom and I came out and I'm in a trailer, you know, the kitchen and the bath or the kitchen and the living room is all one big area. And I was like moving towards this back door and Brad, one of my best friends is coming towards me and he's got his rifle up with one arm and he's like, Chad, I'm hit. I'm hit. And I was like, bro, it's a hostage. Like move out of my way. Like hostage rescue. We got to go save people. And I stepped up into this hallway and I heard a scream that I'll never forget in my life. And one of our guys is helping this lady in her 60s out of this little small bathroom. And I'll never for forget, she had on green sweatpants, a white t-shirt. She's soaked in blood and he helps her out. And then a lady in her 30s came out, a lady in her 20s came out. And then... Huh? Um, you said a lady in her 20s. Mm -hmm. That's not what you initially said, though. Just All right, wait. go on, go on. And then one of our guys carries this little 10-year-old girl's lifeless body out. Oh, Jesus. And there's just blood all over her face. Um, her hair's all matted from the blood. And I, I, and he just walks her across. And like, to this day, it just, I like, I, I have to stop because of the emotions involved of seeing it. And he walks her to the bottom of the stairs and just lays that lifeless body down there at the bottom of the stairs. And the suspect's down in the bathroom. Um, we had taken him. And... I sat there and looked and it's like controlled chaos. Jeff Maxwell, another one of our guys took a 30 caliber round to the hip, but clipped us for more artery as Howard, you know, that's not good. No, that's um, bad. Yeah. And it blew out the back of his ass, took another round through the magazine of his rifle that he was holding, went through the magazine and caught him up here in the neck. Uh. And, and I'm just standing there and it's like controlled chaos. And I was pissed and I was like, we got it wrong. Just like you said, there's too many people inside that bathroom. And the reason I tell, you know, it was so powerful is because for three and a half, almost four hours, that little 10 year old girl, Summer, she sat on the edge of the bathtub with her mom sitting on the ledge next to her and her grandmother was sitting on the toilet. And the suspect over and over again kept saying, what, who do you want? Summer's sister. 
And she, that little 10 year old girl could have ended this at any point and said, you want my sister, mom, stand up, pull the shower curtain back. Cause my sister's hiding in the bathtub behind us. No shit. So, yeah. So when he forced his way inside the trailer, Summer's sister laid in the bathtub, heard her mom pulled the shower curtain and sat in front of it. And he never checked back there for three and a half, almost four hours. Wow. Damn. So, so who uh, all gets shot? This? So you've said, you know, one of your buddies takes a round in the arm. Another one gets shot, uh, you know, femoral artery. Out the ass. Sick. Out the ass, yeah. Um, guy that originally opened the door, dead. Deceased. Suspect shot by you guys? He was and somehow survived. Um, well, he's a bad guy. You got to – well, never mind. Yeah, he's a bad guy. Um, the – any other, other women? The, the 10 year old shot. Yeah. But here, Sean, let me stop you there. Four weeks ago, I walked into a restaurant to go eat after teaching a class for my, what I do now. And this hostess sits me down. She's got a mask on. And she's, she's like, can I get y'all some water? So I said, yeah. And she looks and she goes, I remember you. And I was like, Uh Oh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Is it one of the, one of those Tulsa stories, Chad? <laughs> You know, and I looked down, I didn't see the red boots. And so, um, <laughs> inside joke, listeners, inside joke. So I said, that, Well, I don't remember you. And she pulls her mask down. She says, My name's Summer. And she says, 11 years ago, you saved my life. Oh, damn, wow. brother. Oh, wow. That little 10 year old girl survived. And she survived by like bleeding control training that we use today and teach today. So it was, it was quite an emotional lunch, to say the least. You can't imagine. Well, and, and how about the deputies? Uh, they survive and make full recovery? They did. So Brad made a full recovery. I mean, he's, he actually has a big indention in his bicep. We, we actually take shots of whiskey out of at parties <laughs> now. Um, 107? And, yeah. I, do, I, I do him out of Howard's belly button. It's uh, uh, also it's, known it's, as the hairy bagel. Yeah, it's, it's a big indention also. <laughs> Um, but yeah, everyone, everyone made a full recover, uh, unfortunately, other than the gentleman that was originally shot through the door, but, um, and that guy's spending the rest of his life in prison for them you know, as he, for, as he should, you know? Yeah. Do you guys have the death penalty there in South Carolina? We do. Um, and actually the, there's legislation right now to offer the, if you want now, um, you can elect to have the firing squad. Do you know what? I actually just saw something about that in the news. I don't know if it was about south carolina uh as an option or if there's somewhere else that currently has reinstated it uh i saw it on some other law enforcement related you know i can speak instagram post very well oh do tell me yeah because the drugs they use in lethal injection are drugs that we use to actually save people and so the companies that are in the business of saving people don't want their drugs being used to kill people it's kind of against the thing so the drugs that the biggest thing that they give people in uh, during the death penalty is they give them a massive dose of potassium, which causes them to have heart arrhythmias and their heart basically explodes and stops beating. Well, I saw uh, Gerard Butler's movie, uh, Law Abiding Citizen, and he took control <laughs> of the potassium and so forth. And, uh, you know, it was, it right. was a so that was death, it. but, you know, his, his little girl was killed and. Yeah, he had it coming. Yeah, don't have any, don't have any uh, soft feelings for right, that. Right, so it's potassium. Very good potassium. Okay, um, so you were on the squat team for a while. You got out of that after ten years, and I heard you got loaned out. Like they kind of passed you around and passed you over to some guys at the ATF. Yeah, so I was basically a <clears throat> liaison and TFO with the ATF. What's a TFO? Uh, it's a task force officer. Basically, you. You're a, you work for the locals, but you're a supplement. Sean says it better than I do. I always defer to him when I explain this, but basically every federal agency has TFOs, basically local law enforcement. That is a liaison between the federal uh, law enforcement agencies and the locals. Sean, can okay. you explain it better? Or are you good with it? No, you hit it great. And, and I will elaborate for you. How's that? Um, it, it's basically guys, I don't want to say necessary on loan, but yes, on loan, um, the ATF or the FBI or the DEA that makes somebody a task force officer, you basically get uh, federal cred credentials. So you get to help them with their cases and their prosecutions and the federal grand juries and things like that. And in it, it helps their numbers, it boosts their numbers for cases federally 
and the department gets to say, hey, we're good working partners with our, our federal agencies, um, and it helps out with funding, basically. Gotcha. Money. All right, so, so interagency love. Boom, there you go. Gotcha. So what'd you do for the ATF? Um, so I basically worked some long-term undercover assignments for them. As a cheerleader? Uh, it was as a cheerleader. <laughs> 21 Jump Street. <laughs> <laughs> My name is the Jeff. <laughs> My name is Jeff. <laughs> yeah, this is Hefe. All right, go ahead, 21 Jump Jeff. Street. <laughs> no, in fact, I got pulled in for, there was a group that was committing home invasions. They were basically traveling around targeting high-level cartel drive drug dealers. Wait a minute. You mean you mean the majority of home invasion robberies happen don't happen on everyday citizens? Isn't this, it amazing, Sean, this, how many people are like, uh, I'm just afraid my house is gonna get broken into and my family's gonna die. And I'm like, eh, if that happens, uh, your old man's involved in some gambling, <laughs> some dope, or some dirty prostitution. That's literally the uh, I can speak from my own experience. Again, I, I have to regularly say that because there will be those stories out there that don't fall into this. But from every home invasion robbery I'm familiar with, it's because somebody has a boatload of guns in their house that their kids are advertising on Snapchat or something like that. They're selling a bunch of dope or they're showing a bunch of money to people or they're selling, a, uh, you know, on their social media. Those are the victims of home invasion robberies. So there, there's a reason why these people get targeted. I'm not saying it's deservingly so, but there's a reason those uh, happen to those people, not people like you and I. Okay, gotcha. Now, I will say one more thing before we move on. We, as in law enforcement, if it happens, even if it happens to a dope dealer, we will still investigate it and prosecute and go after the bad guys that do it. You don't get a free, a free pass because you're robbing other dope dealers. You know, if they want to cooperate as a victim, we will go out and make the arrest. Good, good, good. All right. So you're working for ATF with this home invasion, and these guys are robbing the cartel? Yeah. That's stupid. Doesn't end well for you at all. Um, so they said, hey, this guy's, these guys are have committed several murders. We want you to go undercover and like try to infiltrate this group. And I was like, well, I guess this is where I hug my mom and dad by. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I love you, mom. <laughs> um, so we they had an informant whose family was doing this and they made the introduction and basically these guys were you know targeting high level cartel tied drug dealers they'd find out where their stash house was kick the door in execute them steal their dope drive it back down to miami push it out on the streets and i was like all right let's do it so this um, is some made... stuff like out of the movies so they were going and robbing drug dealers and killing cartel members and stealing their drugs and then reselling them and and drive back yep Exactly. How, Howard, you said out of the movies, man, if you're a police officer in a, a decent size jurisdiction city, it is real life, man. It is what they make movies about. Hey, I like movies. All right. All right. That's why we have this podcast. So we can show that these people that, are doing real stuff. All right. right. That's why we have Chad Ayers here. That's right. Keep talking, Chad. Sorry. No, you're good. So they had arrested a guy on federal firearms charges and he's like, Hey, look, I can, I don't feel like going to prison for 28 years. And no, it, the dude told me, he's like, man, at my age, he was like 38, 39 years old. He's like, at my age, it ain't called snitching. It's called survival. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> very true. Um, so basically he introduced us to this group and I, I told him, I said, Hey, look, I drive a tow truck full time for a living. That's how I make my money. I said, once a month, I get a call to drive to a house and I, you know, go in there they gave me two kilos of cocaine. I put them in my backpack, walk outside, put my backpack in a car attached to my tow truck, drive up to Charlotte, drop the dope off, get the money, drive back down, give them the money. And then they give me a, the cut of the money. And I said, I've supplemented my income like that for the last two and a half years. And I said, but they quit giving me my same cut of the money, but they're threatening to kill my little girl if I don't keep making the same runs and I don't know what to do. So this was your undercover story you had for these guys. This was the story that I had and okay. presented to them. So we were okay. in a pool hall one night, you know, eating buffalo wings, telling that. But, you know, so there's no entrapment issues, Sean. You know, I basically had to say, you don't have to do this. I don't even know your name yet, bro. If you don't want to do this, no harm, no foul. And the dude, like, looked around, and he took a bite of his wing. And he's like, bro, we kill people for a living. That's what we do. And I was like, Damn. 
All right. Well, sounds like we got the right guy. Yeah. <laughs> no entrapment okay. here. <laughs> Can I get you some more wings? <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting there on my button cam, like, say that one more time. <laughs> I'm sure he and, was eating spicy wings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I said, all right, I'm going to be in touch with you. And he gave me a burner phone pulled it out of his pocket he brought a burner phone he's like only talk to me on this phone i'm not getting caught and this is what i realized these guys as i talked to this guy over the next few weeks they planned almost better than any swat raid we'd ever planned before they were meticulous in their planning and that's why those guys had never been caught huh and, and how, uh, how, how long have they been doing this uh at least 18 months and Jeez. not all of them were homicides but they were they were a pretty established lit crew that going around doing licks on these places so so let me ask you is if they're from miami and, and i'm not I, i'm aware of um the united states and its layout and the, the locations of states that's called geography I, I was getting there i was going to use the word geography but so south carolina is obviously north of florida um, a few states. And so these guys were essentially running up and down the East East coast is basically what they were doing. Is there like a major highway or something that kind of runs through from Miami up to you guys? Yeah. So they, they had hit Jacksonville. They'd hit Savannah. They'd hit Wilmington, North Carolina. So basically traveling up I-95, getting Intel. I don't know how on these high level cartel guys, finding out where stash houses were. So that, yeah, they were using that corridor. And then one of their cousins was popped in Atlanta. And he's like, I ain't going to prison for 28 years. Mm -hmm. Survival. I'm rat on my <laughs> Survive mode. <laughs> All right. So, so you've got your story laid out yeah. with these guys. You're a tow truck driver. You uh, move dope in a vehicle that's on your tow truck. And how does this all play out? So I called him about three weeks later. I said, Hey, we're within about a day of this going down. I need y'all to drive up. And so they're like, well, man, I need a car. I said, man, got you covered. So I don't, we already had, we already had a car down there that was wired up for audio and video uh, at an enterprise <laughs> at the Miami Dade airport. And these guys don't realize that. So they get in the car, they throw their duffel bags in, they're driving up and we're using some technology i guess to monitor police are very sneaky yeah and so we're hearing everything and watching everything and so they get up to greenville we got a hotel room and they walk in with these two duffel bags and drop them on the bed the next morning and i'm already there and i was like man you ready for this he's like man i ain't never been so ready in my life he said i'm about to get rich and i was like <laughs> no nah, you're not so he, he pulls out these two AK 47s and BDU style pants and shirts to say, please. And the dude was like, Hey man, why you drive that tow truck with the car on it up to Charlotte to drive the dope? And I was like, well, if I get stopped up on 85, I just tell him I'm towing this car off the interstate, man. And I can't get caught with the dope. He said, Oh, you, man, you a thinker. You like me, you should move down to Miami and work with me. And I was like, man, you don't... if only you knew what's about to happen here shortly. Yep. And so we're, we're using the hotel room door and pretending that's the door to the house. And, you know, basically guys, the plan was to knock on the door. And when that dude answered the door to take me in to get the dope, these guys would come in from the side of the house and take care of business. But the oldest of those three dudes looked at me, he's like, bro, when you go through that door, don't have your mouth open. And I was like, dude, I ain't saying a fucking word. I ain't trying to get killed. And he's like, you don't get it. He says, physically, don't have your mouth open because when I shoot him in the face, I don't want his brains to go in your mouth. Oh, damn, dude. Ooh. <laughs> and I wished this day I could like <laughs> have that video because I, I swear to God, I was like this. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, God, please don't. Yeah. Please, <laughs> um, please don't let me anybody's brains in my mouth, nor my <laughs> brains in someone else's mouth. Exactly. So it, you know, 30 That's minutes later. These guys are taken down. Uh, ATF SWAT team was waiting for them in the storage facility. They're spending the rest of their life in federal prison for the murders of those guys. Good for you, man. So how, how, how did the takedown happen? We pulled into a storage facility. Uh, and when that gate dropped behind them, ATF SWAT team was waiting in one of those storage units. And so I started walking away. I was like, yo, yo, it's them. I'm like, yo, hello, hello, hello. And all of a sudden, flashbangs started lobbing across the top of those things. I was like, my God, don't let that damn garage door get stuck because I am so fucked if so. Uh, and, yeah, these guys came out and they're like, man, we don't know that dude. We don't know that dude. 
you know, and, and then I, about an hour and a half later, I walked by and I badged them and they're like, oh, this dude's a cop. Yeah. <laughs> you, played uh, it, you know, it was awesome, man. It was, it was seriously, I loved my career in law enforcement. And then, you know, I got out about three years ago and it's been awesome. So what are you doing now that you're out of law enforcement? You go back to professional cheerleading? In fact, I did. And so I, for the, for the Miami Dolphins, I'd say not. Dallas Cowboys or who you were with, man. I thought I saw you on that TV show, Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Uh, no, what, are you do, I, what are you doing nowadays? Actually, I know, but tell everybody else. Yeah. So I started a company called proactive response group and you can find us proactiverg.com. So we teach active shooter response to corporations, churches, and schools. Uh, there's a lot of bad, you know, models out here and, these events are happening. So basically, how do you survive in the event of a workplace violence situation or an active shooter response? Um, so we traveled the country doing that. We trained about 68,000 people in person. Uh, across Dang. The country. Well, hey, give our uh, give our listeners like a quick synopsis. Do when you have an active shooter, what do you do? Get under a desk? Howard, I'd smack you right now if I was in Tulsa. <laughs> That's not yeah, what you it's, did? It's not an earthquake happening. No, it's not, it's what not do you, a tornado. What do you do then? I mean, the... People don't know. Tell them what they did. No, but I mean, that's, I appreciate you bringing that up because a lot of, there's this whole run, hide, fight method that people have heard years and years. If you find yourself in an active shooter situation, which let's be honest, active shooter situations are on the rise across the country. And they say, silence your cell phone, get under your desk and hide in an active shooter situation. Well, if the gunman comes in there and you're sitting under your desk, he's not going to be like, Oh, Miss Betty, you watch that video. I'm not going to shoot you. And so that doesn't give you the best chance to survive. So, you know, get away. Absolutely. If you can get away, get away. But if you can't get away, barricade your office, but you damn well be ready to fight. And so um, I, I hate that this is happening, but you also need to know how to stop massive bleeding. And that's what we do in our classes is the teach, which by the way, May is national stop the bleed month. Um, so we teach how to stop massive bleeding in the event of an active shooter, because EMS isn't going to be there in time to stop your bleeding and save your life. Hey, it's real simple as a nurse. If it bleeds, you put your hand on it, put pressure on it, grab whatever it is, put pressure on it. That's all you got to do. See, Howard, you could be an advocate for me. Oh, you can do the tourniquets <laughs> too, if you want to do that. But we, yeah, we don't do a lot of tourniquets where we are. No, but I do. I, I, I mean, in all seriousness, seriousness, these events are happening seriously at alarming rates. And so many companies just check a box on this topic and say, oh, uh, will you send this flyer out? But I am, you know, we, we have a great time, but I'm passionate about this because I'm tired of seeing people die in these events and you don't have to. Well, and that's it. I mean, there are companies that uh, will, will spend money for training for something. Computer uh, training. I I'm, hate that. Like I said, there, there's all kinds of training they will send people off to. Um, and, and I'm not trying to plug Chad's group here, but you know, this type of stuff, as he mentioned is happening. I mean, it's almost a, every couple of days on the news, there is some sort of mass shooting. Now, some of them are workplace shootings. You know, there was just one recently that happened at a club. I think there was like 25 people shot or something like that. Uh, Miami. A bit, yeah. A little bit of a, you know, a different scenario. Um, but these things are happening quite a bit that, you know, the, the country is back to normal after a year of everybody kind of locked down. And unfortunately these things are happening. Um, so, you know, that type of combat training, I think is another term that's used for it. Um, you know, it, it is needed. I think everybody should have it. I know in my, my truck, we could go outside and I'll show you in there. I've got basically an emergency kit, just like that. I've got a tourniquet, I've got a chest seal. I've got these type of things. And that's in my personal vehicle, right? You know, so heaven forbid, you know, I'm ever somewhere where you know, hopefully I don't ever need it, but you know, you roll up on somebody, whether it be a car accident or some sort of a uh, workplace injury or the violence, workplace violence, or just violence in general, you know, people need to be prepared for that. You're absolutely right. I have never been in a shooting, but I've been in lots of, I'd say at least a half a dozen times that I've rolled up on a fresh accident. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of as a nurse, we stop. And we see what we can do. And having a basic skill set can be the difference for somebody living and dying. So, yeah. I mean, hey, Howard, have... Howard, you being a nurse, you, I mean, it's a prime example. Massive bleeding is massive bleeding. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. matter if it, 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 you know, Sean and I have talked about this so many times of how many of our buddies are alive today because of having tourniquets and not from gunshot wounds, but from accidents. I, right. I think that 
and, and at Proactive Response Group, that's what we're here to do is I tell people all the time, I'm, just, I'm in the business of saving lives. Like I'm tired of seeing people die in these events and I just want to give you a better mindset. So it's Proactive Response Group. Yeah, give us a plug. What's, a, what's, what's your website? What's your phone number? Yep, it's proactiverg.com and then it's Proactive Response Group on Instagram or you can follow me at Chad Ayers one I think on Instagram. I don't know, Sean... Just hashtag red you, you can find he, chad follows you can look at me you'll find chad on yeah that, absolutely so and we'll we'll put it up on cocktails and cocktails <laughs> absolutely our yeah site. we'll put you up there on the on the youtube or our uh, instagram page and so forth so chad much love brother um always a pleasure talking to you always a pleasure seeing you he was here in town with us just a, a few weeks ago we had a lot of bourbon that night that was your retirement it was my retirement so uh, fantastic time. I'm now a civilian like yourself, like Chad, uh, I'm trying a few different things and Chad brother, love you. look forward to seeing you here in a few days and, and, you know, celebrating, celebrating your birthday. I'm excited, man. Howard, Sean, thank you so much for having me.